Good evening. God bless you. This is our third Bible study dealing with the pre-tribulational rapture. As I have said in the past Bible studies, uh, I am a pre-trib. I believe that the preponderance of the evidence of the Bible leans to pre-trib. But I also want to say that I respect people that hold other positions, and you should too. Um, every position, pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib, and those are just the, th the three major, every position has some scripture to support it. But again, I believe that the weight of the evidence, the heavy hitter evidence, supports a pre-trib rapture. Now, one of the uh, criticisms that comes against people that believe in the pre-trib rapture swings on a young lady by the name of Mary MacDonald in Scotland in the 1830s. And the thinking is that she got up and she prophesied a pre-tribulational rapture. And uh, because of that, she sort of infected Darby, John Nelson Darby, who then passed it on to the brethren, who then put it in the notes of his Bible that he put out, and it began to infect the entire church in general. The problem is it's just simply not true. First of all, we have writings all the way back to 60 AD, between 60 and 130 AD, Pepeus uh, wrote concerning the pre-trib rapture. Clement of Rome, 90 to 100 AD. Uh, the, she the Shepherd of Hermes, 96 to 150 AD. Barnabas, 100 AD. Didache, 100 to 160 AD. Justin Martyr, 110 to 165. The Epistle of Barnabas, 117 to 138. Irenaeus, 120 to 202. Tertullian, 145 to 220. Uh, Hi Hi Hippolytus, 185 to 236. Cyprian, 200 to 250. And Lactinus, 260 to 330. So all the way back, to 60 AD, within 30 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have writings from the early church fathers dealing with the pre-trib rapture. Now, when it came to Mary MacDonald, if you read her prophecy, which you can get, by the way, on Wikipedia, she lives between eight... 1815 and 1840, and her prophecy is published in 1840. The problem is, Darby had always already been thinking about this. He'd been involved in a car accident and took a couple of years off to recover, and while he's recovering, he begins, begins to think through dispensationalism and moves on then to the pre-tribulational rapture. We have his writings from the 1820s to the 1830s. It's not until 1840 that Mary MacDonald supposedly makes her prophecy. If you're of a mind to, I encourage you, go online, read her prophecy. You're going to discover she not only does not believe in a pre-trib rapture, she sees the church going through and being tormented by, uh, 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 by the beast, by the Antichrist. And so the idea that she somehow stood up in a service, and by the way, she was deemed by the people of that time to be demon-possessed. I have no idea whether this was a case. But they sent out men to examine her, and the men decided she was speaking under the unction of a demon. And if that's the case, what she actually said was, in fact, that the church is going to go through the tribulation. 
So she did not prophesy a pre-tribulational rapture. And again, I encourage you, go on to Wikipedia, pull her up her name, Mary McDonald. Sounds like a common name, but put beside it 1815 to 1840, you'll get right there. Or put beside it Mary McDonald prophet, and you'll get right there very quickly. And then spend some time going through what she says, because it has nothing to do with a pre-trib rapture, which knocks out that entire theory that this came from a demon-possessed woman, and that's how it got to the church. No, it didn't. We have it in writings all the way back to 60 AD, within about 30 years of the death and resurrection of Christ. So we come to the issue of the tribulation. I'm going to do something here that I don't usually do. I'm going to read you a couple of chapters of the Bible. And I want to do this because I want you to get the flow and the direction of where this is headed and how it's being laid out. It's being written, obviously, by the Holy Spirit through the hand of John, who is isolated on the island of Patmos, somewhere around about 90 A.D. And John begins to write in Revelation chapter 5, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides. Now just before I go on, I want to kind of give you an idea of what this is like. The scroll was rolled, as scrolls are. By the way, you know when you're able to turn to chapter and verse, turn to Revelation chapter 5, do you realize that's not in the Bible? Chapter and verse was added much later on. Um, we'll talk some other time about how Jews identified their positions in the Bible. Scroll was usually quite a bit longer than this piece of paper. But as you would look at it, it would have a seal on the outside here. And then, if you had permission, you could break that seal. Now, only somebody greater than the person that placed the seal could break a seal. And so you would break the seal, and you would begin to open, and there would be another seal in here. So you would be privy to this first piece of information, but not what's beyond it, unless you had permission to break the second seal. And if you had permission to break the second seal, you'd break that seal and go a little bit further until you came to the third seal, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. Now with that in mind, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, so it's written on the inside and on the outside, with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? Remember, only somebody equal or greater than the person that sealed it has the right to open it. And so the question goes, I see this scroll, <clears throat> I see it's sealed. Who's got the right to open it? Who's got the right to break the seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So a search was made, essentially. And nobody showed up to be worthy. And I wept because no one who was, was found who was worthy to open the scroll or even look inside it. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll with its seven, and its seven seals. <coughs> and then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So one is found who is worthy to open it. One is found that has the right and the power and the might to open the scroll. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah. We know him as Jesus. Verse 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Now we know who this is. It's the lamb. Each one had a harp 
and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men from, uh, for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked, and there... Uh, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, strength and honor, glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that was in them singing to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So in this amazing scene, you're taken right into the throne room, and there the Father holds in His hand a scroll. Many believe, and it's probably correct, that it's the title deed to the earth. And the question is, who is worthy to open this? Who is equal? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He's the one who is equal. So He was able to open that scroll, and everybody worships, and they said, you're, 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 you're worthy because you died on the cross. Your worthiness comes because you have purchased men from every tribe, nation, language, people, and you have done so for God. Therefore, you're worthy. And they fall down and they begin to worship Him. And I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. And it was given a crown, and he rode out to conquer, bent on conquest. And when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given to, to take power, pardon me, given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. And to him was given a large sword. Now, by the way, this kind of thing happened, if you remember, on Sunday. We looked at the Amalekites and the time when they turned on each other. That's exactly what's going to happen here. The first angel goes out, and he is bent on destruction. He is absolutely uh, taken over by the thought of conquest. And he goes out, and he causes nations to want to conquer nations. And then finally the second seal is broken and the second horse goes out. And his job is to bring the sword, to bring the weapons, if you will, and to turn people against each other. This will be a worldwide destruction. But notice who it is that's opening the seals. It's not the devil. Verse 5. When the lamb opened the third seal... I heard the living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and <coughs> three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil or the wine. And what's being predicted here is famine. Tremendous famine worldwide. I frequently see people online saying things like, oh, what's happening here is the, uh, is the, the uh, third seal or the second seal or the fourth seal. They have no idea. The scope of this is worldwide. And then the Lamb opened the fourth seal. And I heard a voice from the four living creature, fourth living creature say, Come! And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. By the way, that pale is a very specific pale. It's a pale green. It's bile green. 
Its rider was named Death and Hades uh, was following close behind him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, if it's not already bad enough, the first one comes out bent on conquest, and you start having nation turning against nation, ethnos rising against ethnos. Then the second one comes, brings a sword and destruction. Then we have this tremendous, tremendous famine. And the Bible describes here under this seal, judgment, that a fourth of the earth is killed. That is a phenomenal number. I think we are at about eight or nine billion right now. Imagine a fourth of eight or nine billion. That's no small thing. There won't be enough graves to bury them. And when he opened the fifth seal, this is Jesus now opening the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those that have been slain because of the word of God and the testimony he main they maintained. And they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Now notice. How long until you judge? How long until you judge? That's going to happen, by the way, in Revelation chapter 20, when the judgment seat will come forward. But what we're seeing here is people are recognizing that those that are under the, the souls under the throne are recognizing that there's coming a, a judgment day, payday some, someday. Then each one was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer till the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. So under this particular seal, those that are under the throne are, are crying out, uh, or under the, uh, the altar are crying out and saying, how long, how long? When, when do we get our comeuppance? When do we get our payback for what has transpired, for the shortening of our lives, for the shedding of our blood? And they're told, hang on, it's coming, it's coming. And I watched as he opened the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. And the moon turned blood red. There's a guy that's written some books on the blood moons. Uh, didn't turn out to be correct. There was all kinds of holes in his theories, but he made a lot of money. What is going to happen here is not a predictable blood moon any more than it is a predictable time that you can't see the sun or the moon. This will be a miraculous thing, out of character with everything that we know in the cosmos. The whole earth, or the moon, pardon me, will be turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to the earth as late figs from a fig tree were shaken by a strong wind, that were shaken by a strong wind. So what's going to happen here, it appears, is that molten, bright meteors, as bright as a star, are going to begin to fall all over the earth. Now just think for one second about the picture in your mind of the moon. How many times have you seen images of the moon? I use one as a backdrop on my computer. Covered in craters. Imagine what it's going to be like on earth when these molten hot things start falling like figs from a fig tree and begin to destroy indiscriminately all over the earth. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. 
Tomorrow, go on out. Have a look at the Rockies that are around and surrounding us. They're going to be moved out of their place. Vancouver Island is going to be moved out of its place. The islands of the sea, all the way down to the south, all the way down to the Arctic, are going to be moved out of their place. Are they going to be sunk? I don't know. Where are they going to be moved to? I have no idea. But they will be moved out of their place. The map will no longer look the same from that day forward. The sky receded like a scroll. In other words, the sky appeared to be rolling up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth, the princes and the generals, the rich and the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves and among the rocks in the mountains. And they called out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The people now fully understand exactly what's happening. They know this is an act of God. But listen to this. Hide us from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? The world at this stage knows this is not the devil, knows that this is not mother nature. By the way, there is no mother nature. There's father nature. There's never been a mother nature. That's goddess worship. It is Father God who owns the plan and owns the planet. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? These people are now aware, fully aware, that this is God. This is called the wrath. This chapter is the wrath chapter where all of a sudden we're not dealing with the churches anymore. By the way, you never hear from the churches again after chapter four, after chapter three. Four and five deals with being transported to heaven. It's as though the writer of the book of Revelation is moved from the earth to heaven and now from chapter, uh, chapter four and five on, you are hearing literally from somebody standing in heaven. And these people know that this is God breaking out against them. This is the wrath of God. Now the question is, is God angry at you? Is God angry at you? Would he destroy us along with the whole world? We're going to be looking in the future at some rapture passages. Some you're not going to expect, incidentally. But I tend to believe that because you're a believer, God has a special plan for you. And the whole world won't be in on it. It's for those who have come to Christ now. We are called the church. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rare will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood. 
how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, the wrath chapter is chapter 6, chapters 5 and 6. And we're now told we are to be saved from God's wrath. Now, some are going to say, well, that's referring to hell. Well, this is just the first of many that I'm going to read to you. In a moment, you'll be convinced this is not referring to hell. This is referring to the point in the tribulation where Jesus breaks the seals and he begins to pour out God's wrath. And the Bible says so clearly, we will be saved from the wrath of God. Actually, let's just play, I hate to use the term, devil's advocate. Let's suppose that it is referring to hell. I would then have to suggest that what this is referring to is not just hell, but all wrath from God. If we were to put this down and say, okay, all it means is we're just not going to go to hell, which is the truth, because we're saved, then it must also mean that we are, we are protected from the wrath of God during the tribulation. The wrath is the wrath is the wrath is the wrath. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only so, but also we rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we now have received reconciliation. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This is quite a well-known topic in the Bible, spoken on many times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The coming wrath, in context with the book, is the tribulation. And the Bible says he rescues us from the coming wrath. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 for a moment. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. While we are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Not hell, not death and hell, destruction will come on them. They're saying peace and safety, it's all going to be good and destruction will fall on them as labor pains on a pregnant woman. But you, brothers, are not in the darkness that this day should surprise you like a thief. There's the us and the them. The unbelievers, it will surprise them because things will appear to be peaceful. Then all of a sudden, Jesus will begin to open the, the scroll and break the seals and destruction will come on them, and they won't expect it. They won't understand it for the, to begin with. Eventually, they'll come to understand it, but they won't understand it to begin with. But you, brothers, you, that's you, that's us, that's the believers, are not in the darkness that this day should surprise you like a thief. You're sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let's not be like the others who are asleep, but let's be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those that get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let's be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And here it is, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. He did not appoint you to suffer wrath. All the wrath of God is satiated in the blood of Jesus. The price has been paid. Any wrath coming from God has been paid for 
by the blood of Jesus. He died so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you're doing. Now, I always have to ask this question because it's just one I grew up with. I grew up in a household where the common belief was at least mid-trib and probably post-trib. Christ could come back in the middle of the tribulation, in which case we're going to be tortured and horrible, beheaded and so on, or at the end, in which case we're definitely all going to die. Uh, and the only hope that we've got to live a few weeks or months later is to have rations and supplies on hand for when there's no longer any food and the mark of the beast is out and so on and so on and so on. Now, with that message, go on out and encourage each other. You know, brother, good to see you. God bless you. I bet you can't wait for the mark of the beast to come. Oh, praise God. Isn't it going to be wonderful when we're tortured and tormented? Uh, they're going to cut our heads off. Isn't that going to be exciting? I, I'd, I'd like to have uh, short back and sides. Not too much off the top. I'm already short. You know, at a certain point, you just realize this is not, that's not an encouraging message. And yet the writer here tells us the message should be encouraging. I find it encouraging to believe that Christ is coming back for me before he starts breaking the seals on this earth and before he starts pouring out his wrath on this earth. Turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Three and four are the messages to the churches. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those that are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews but are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those that live on the earth. Now let me just start by saying the Church of Philadelphia is long gone. You can go and visit the ruins. So this had to have a meaning beyond just dealing with that particular church. Because of the seven churches of Revelation, most of them don't exist. So if this has a meaning beyond that, then the promise is to those that keep his word, to those that listen to his command and endure patiently, he will keep us from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world. Friends, that's the tribulation. He's going to keep us. Now, by the way, some say, here's what he's going to do. And we're going to deal with this a lot next week, by the way. He's going to tuck us away somewhere neat. We're all going to have underground shelters and, we're, you know, we're going to go and we're going to, he's going to just blind the world to us. They won't see us. We'll just hide. Well, that doesn't work. Because when you read the book of Revelation, all those that refuse to take the mark, not some, all, are beheaded. So it doesn't work. Either you have a pre-tribulational rapture, or you have to explain how we're going to survive and yet all be put to death. Doesn't work. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11.
And it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. While we wait for the blessed hope. Well, what kind of blessed hope is it to wait to have your head cut off? What kind of blessed hope is it to wait for the Antichrist? What kind of blessed hope is it to suffer through the sixth seals that I read tonight? And by the way, there's a seventh, and it's a doozy. What kind of blessed hope is this? The Bible talks about something good coming from believers. It says, encourage one another with this. It says we're waiting for our blessed hope. Our blessed hope, friends, is the rapture of the church. And it's not going to happen halfway through after we have been tormented by Jesus and then turned over to the Antichrist to be finished off. No. It's going to happen before the tribulation. Turn with me to the first rapture in the Bible. Genesis chapter 5. Verse 18. Genesis chapter 5, verse 18. By the way, if you ever get into these genealogies, I promise you it will be one of the most rewarding Bible studies you ever take. Uh, it is absolutely fascinating to track these people through the Bible. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Hello, uh, altogether, Jared lived 962 years and then he died. Enoch, when he was 65 years, became the father of of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God and then he was no more because God took him away. Here is the first mention of a rapture in the Bible. Here is a man that is snatched off of the earth and as far as we know does not die. He goes up when he is 365 years old. And the Bible says he walked with God. But here's something interesting. Well, no, I'm going to hold that for a minute. I'll give you something less interesting to start with. Turn to Hebrews 11, verse 5. Hebrews 11, verse 5. <coughs> By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. He didn't experience death. And God had taken him away. There are some that could be in this room tonight that will not die. It's very possible that the Lord could come back anytime. By the way, let me tell you what he's waiting for. Absolutely nothing. It's accomplished, it's done, it's finished. Every prophecy concerning the rapture has been fulfilled and he could come back at any time. 
Now there is another coming back at the end of the book of Revelation. This time he comes back with a sword. But when he comes back for the church, he comes to receive us to himself, that where I am, you might be also. Well, Enoch didn't experience death, and there are some, I believe, alive now in our world that will not die, that will hear the trumpet, that will see the return of the Lord. Now, by the way, every generation has said that. So why do we think, or why do I think that it's now? Because all of the signs are fulfilled. Nation has risen against nation. Consider what's going on in Russia. We have wars and rumors of wars. We have famines in the world and pestilence. It's all done. It's all happening. If you haven't had COVID, cheer up. You will. And... When you're done with that, monkeypox is waiting for you. And when you're done with that, they'll create something else. There'll be a half a dozen more coming down the pike. Pestilence was predicted in the book of Luke. It's all happened. Right in front of our eyes. So close, by the way, that we didn't see it. And now, what's going to happen? Well we know we're in the end times. We know this because on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and said, this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit. And so he identified this time period as the last days. And if that began uh, on the day of Pentecost, then I promise you we are in the last of the last days. And I truly believe that there are some here, wouldn't it be great if it was all of us, we'll never taste of death. And there are some here that will die. But whether we are dead or alive, it matters not. We're going to be in that meeting in the air in sweet, sweet by and by. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life. He did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone that comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that earnestly or diligently seek him. All right, you've lived your life for Christ. You've served him all your life. Here's your reward. Antichrist, cut their heads off. Doesn't really work well, does it? He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He's one that will bless us and sustain us and keep us, make a way for us in this life. And when the Lord returns, he'll take us to be with him. Well, there's something, ah, we'll just go here first. I'm saving the best till last. Turn in your Bibles to Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Enoch. By the way, there was a couple of Enochs in, the, in Genesis. And so it identifies seventh from Adam. In other words, our Enoch, the one that was raptured. Enoch, seventh from Adam, Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they have done in their ungodly way. And all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. In other words, Enoch was a preacher of righteousness. And Enoch knew that there was a coming judgment. Enoch knew that there was a coming cataclysmic judgment. And ultimately, at the end of the book of Revelation, the Lord does come with all of the holy ones riding on horses and dressed in white. And Enoch begins to prophesy this 
before even the flood. But before we get to the end of the book of Revelation, there's going to be a number of judgments, a number of terrible things that are going to transpire. Enoch, seventh man, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. He had a vision. He had an understanding. He knew that there was a coming judgment. Well, let me describe the times Enoch lives in. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. By the way, in the original Hebrew, it's clear that they were choosing married women. They were taking other men's wives. And the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. And from that point forward, Noah has 120 years to complete the building of the ark. The Nephilim on the earth in those days, that's the fallen ones, were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when the sons of God saw the daughter of men, daughters of men and had children by them, they were heroes of old and men of renown. Here is your original superheroes. Here is what uh, you're, 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 you're having human beings cohabiting with angelic beings that have taken on human form or physical form and are producing freaks with tremendous powers, tremendous strength, tremendous ability. If you go back and you look at some of the archaeology, it's absolutely phenomenal. The size, for example, of stones that were fit together so tight that you couldn't get a credit card in between them. Massive tons. Stairs built for giants, skulls that are elongated. One day I might speak on it. We'll deal with this in some future point, not tonight. But these creatures were on the earth. These freaks were on the earth, these super beings. You think Marvel created this? You think Superman came from the comics? Of course not. These were men that were half man, half angelic being, and they were worshiped. They are the gods that brought knowledge to the earth. Again, for another day. And the Lord saw how great the wickedness, man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination of his heart and the thoughts of his heart were wicked all the time. What's going on? We are looking at a world that Enoch was taken out of. Enoch was taken out. Why? Could it be that this is the point at which these individuals came to the earth? Could it be, is it possible, that Enoch was spared this tribulation? Whenever you find a rapture in the Bible, when God is taking somebody out, they're taking them out to avoid tribulation. Why did God bring the Israelites out of Egypt? To avoid the tribulation of being in Egypt. There are so many of these places in the Bible where God rescues people and takes them out because of a tribulation that's there or coming there. And here you have Enoch being taken out. Why? Because the inclination of man's heart was going to be so wicked. And by the time that he is taken, it's another 969 or 900 years, approximately, before the flood comes. And when the flood comes, all mankind and these wicked beings are absolutely and utterly destroyed, wiped out. But Enoch is removed because he walked with God and he prophesied. Well, we know Enoch's prophecy about the coming of the holy ones and the things that are going to happen there. We know that. But perhaps the prophecy you missed was in the name of his son. Enoch 
has a boy. And this particular boy, known as Methuselah, will live 969 years. But his name, when translated to English, is this. When he dies, it will come. When he dies, it'll come. Now, I, I showed my sister this many, many years ago. She said, no, it's just not possible. I said, it is. She said, no, it, it, it can't be. It can't be. I said, it is. So she said, prove it. So we sat down with a calculator and the genealogies. And we worked through the genealogies using the calculator. And I showed her that in the very year that Methuselah dies, the flood comes. Enoch's great prophecy was, look out, payday someday. And then he names his boy, when he dies, payday. When he dies, it'll come. And Enoch is the first in the Bible to be removed, to be raptured. Prior to the Nephilim, prior to the tribulation of the flood. 900 years, incidentally, before. And that's an interesting point. We don't know when the rapture of the church will be, and we don't know when the tribulation will start. We could be taken out tonight, and the tribulation not start for 900 years. Or we could be taken out tonight, and the tribulation starts tomorrow. It's in God's hands, God's timing. Well... In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, we read this. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive will be caught up. Word is harpazo, raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. Well, you know my stance on this. We have a real problem with this text. It says here, the dead in Christ will rise first. Not a problem. Sounds good. That's going to be fun. Can you imagine what it's going to be like driving down 72nd and as you pass the graveyard, it's empty. All the believers are gone. The unbelievers are still there. And after that, we who are still alive are caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. We who are still alive. See, that's a problem. Because when you start reading the book of Revelation, all who do not take the mark of the beast are beheaded. There are some Jews, incidentally, whom God does divinely protect. But we're Gentiles. So as Gentiles, we're going to lose our heads. So how can we be dead and still alive at the return of the Lord? doesn't work. No. We have to be taken out first. And then the tribulation will start. May the Lord bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, encourage your people as they study your word. I pray that you'll lift them, Father, that you'll work in their hearts and in their minds. And that, Father, you'll just open them up to enjoying the fact that you love us so much, you're going to come to take us to be with you. You have not appointed us to suffer your wrath. You have not appointed us 
to go through this time of wrath which is sent to test those that are living on the earth. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you are coming for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen.